Hello friends, this is Stephanie and I wanted to talk with you a little bit about uh, teachings in the modern church and um, some of the, of the things, the phrases, the, the concepts that are being kind of floated around. Uh, but before we start, let's go ahead and pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your word. May it be a la lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. It's words that we hide in our hearts that we might not sin against you. Help us to see what you see. Give us tender hearts. Help us to speak in love and to bless you. Always seeking you first in all we do for your glory and not our own. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so let's go ahead and prop the Bible open and see what we find. Okay, so we are brought to the book of Jeremiah. And actually, I just realized that my headphones were on. There we go. You should be able to hear me better now. Okay, so Jeremiah, uh, I'm looking at chapters 48 and 49. I do not have anything underlined, but my eye is drawn to Jeremiah 47, verse 34. The sound of their cry rises from Heshbon to Elala and Jahaz, from Zoar as far as Huranim and Egloth Shalashaya. For even the waters of Nimrin are dried up. In Moab, I will put an end to those who make offerings on the high places and burn incense to their gods. Thank you, Lord, for this word. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the new apostolic reformation, NAR uh, for short. And I think that God was really speaking through this scripture. Um, the sound of their cries rises. I don't think a lot of these sounds are of God. And I don't think that they have the wisdom in the sense um, that they are purporting to convey. Uh, I'll continue. Um, Verse 35, it said, uh, In Moab I will put an end to those who make offerings on the high places and burn incense to their God, declares the Lord. I think God is making a, a very strong distinction between um, worship for Him and worship that is inspired by perhaps... Uh, power, greed, monetary uh, fulfillment. Before we started, I was trying to find one of the scriptures that I had recently seen in, in prophecy. Um, and yeah, I, I misremembered it. And I want to uh, read the scripture reference that God gave me to start with. Our God is a God of love. Zephaniah 317, some of you may recognize this. The Lord your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior. He will rejoice over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. So we're juxtaposing what can happen in God's presence or presence of other gods, just kind of shouts and noise rising up. God tells us in his word that what he looks after, what he requires is a humble and contrite spirit. He will not despise. Okay, and I probably butchered that <laughs> verse up, it just came to mind. Um, but moving forward, when we learn about prophecy, when we, we talk about it, when we teach on it, our primary focus has got at all times to be the Word of God, the unadulterated Word of God. 
On this channel, I have used uh, translations that are very close, mostly the King James Version. The Geneva Version is also an older version uh, that is very accurate. And then the New American Standard Bible. Every now and then, like I read from the NIV, this Bible is falling apart. I have had it over 20 years, like closer, over 25 years. Uh, it is one that I'm very familiar with and I have so many things underlined with and God speaks to me through this Bible. Juxtapose that against a Bible that I have had in the past, uh, I didn't use because I didn't really feel uh, the Spirit of God in that translation. And then I realized the problem was that it was a a translation or a book is still the NIV, but it was put out by a certain ministry, the Joyce Meyer ministry with her uh, commentary in it. And I know that that's an, one of the prosperity teachers. She uh, doesn't have a, a, let's see, a pure teaching. It's going to be based on works, on what you can do. And um, we don't, we don't look at that. We look at what is God doing and what is he teaching me himself directly we don't put a teacher between our, ourselves and god we must go to the word of god and develop that relationship pour over his bible mark it up the bible says in psalm 27 and i know i've, I've said this before uh, chapter 20 verse 7 some trust in chariots and some trust in horses but ooh, did you hear that thunder wow but we trust in the name of the Lord, our God. Uh, I recently listened to a speaker uh, and the translation that he used and recommended over and over and over again was the Passion Translation. And I'm going to put you on pause real quick as I bring up the article that I recently read on that. All right, so basically the author of this article, which I will link below, sh uh, shows that there is a big, often, I can't say about the whole translation, but there is often uh, a big difference between what is stated in the King James Version and what is shared in this other version. And in fact, has, mm, phrases, I'll say phrases, are often added to these verses. So I went ahead and I found uh, a verse in Galatians. It was uh, the one after the one that the uh, author cites, and I think it's actually even a little more concerning. Uh, this is going to be Galatians 2.20. We should all know this one. It's going to sound very familiar to you this first time. This is going to be the King James Version. Uh, again, this is Galatians 2.20. <clears throat> I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. In fact, I'll go ahead and, and read uh, the last verse uh, of that chapter, the next verse 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So this is going to be the translation, or I'm sorry, the Passion Translation, also Galatians 2.20. My old identity has been co-crucified with Christ. And no longer lives. So we, we from the bat, we've already got some additional words in here, or, or some strange words in here. Uh, and now the essence, okay, that's kind of a, a word that gets floated around that might be related to new age, I would say. Uh, and now the essence of this new life is no longer mine, for the anointed one lives his life through me. And then in italics, we live in union as one. And when um, we, we see italics, uh, italicized text in the scriptures, uh, we can know that it's not part of the original text. It's just been inserted to help give it meaning, supposedly. My new life is empowered by the faith of the Son of God, who loves me so much that he gave himself 
for me and the more italicized text dispensing his life into mine all right and that can also um point to a, a new age idea of we are all little gods um concept uh, and i'll go ahead and read uh, verse 21 so that is why i don't view god's grace as something peripheral for if keeping the law could release God's righteousness to us, then Christ would have died for nothing. So pray over that. Um, I know that uh, God is giving each of us discernment and discretion. Again, that was the, the Passion Translation, and I can link that uh, below as well. Uh, but let's go ahead and continue. Uh, after this conference and i got home i'd actually purchased a book i was like okay i'll learn more about these folks um teachings on prophecy they seem like good people um it was you know is it a church that i you know respected the pastor i'd met before and as soon as i got home and looked at the back of the book i saw the picture of emma stark and i was like oh okay I would not have purchased the book and in fact i removed it from my home because i wasn't going to keep something uh, by an author that many would call a false prophetess in my home so god gave me some scriptures and before i read those scriptures though i will let you hear some of this person's statements for yourselves um, and let you decide. Again, these are short statements. I will link the, the full videos below um, so you can hear and, and come to your own conclusions. Uh, I've only got two clips. This is, uh, she is talking about one of her frequent visits to the throne room where she talks with God uh, in his throne room. Uh, that's a red flag to me, but I will let everybody uh, listen and come to their own conclusions. I talked to you about what I saw in the throne room it, when God caught me up in the spirit. And I saw God as I walked into the throne room, which I do quite often, and I'm used to the, the, the cacophony of the angelic noise uh, and the, you know, the 24 elders doing the business of the throne. But God came off his throne and he's on all fours on the ground in a way I've never seen him before. And he uh, there's a howling, groaning, almost disturbing noise. And I looked to the angels like, do I need to give them space? What do you do when you see God like that? And one of the angels whispered in my ear, remember Gethsemane. And I'm thinking, oh yes, of course, you're supposed to, st to stay, you know, because Jesus was abandoned in that moment. And I kind of kneel down before God. And of course, he's huge and I'm so small. First off, God is spirit. And it's Okay, and you got a little extra commentary from the the original poster. Um, yes, God is spirit, and approaching his throne is not something that we take lightly. It's certainly not something that anyone would ever do on a regular basis and likely live. I mean, this is the presence of Almighty God. Uh, when we see him in the Bible, it's never on all fours. Um, so that was one clip. That's. I'll, I'll go ahead and get the next one. Uh, and then we can oh, look some more, I look at some more of the scriptures that God revealed to me. Uh, with this one, she's talking about how I, well, I guess she has a study on warrior women, which I do not ascribe to that concept, that notion. I did when I was younger, and I regret that because women are supposed to be helpers. Uh, we're not warriors to men, and we're certainly not their protectors. Uh, they protect us, and we help them. Uh, well, let's just listen to what she says. Actually, in the Hebrew, it means God took half of him. Literally, God cut the man in half. So I don't know who this Tim Mackey guy is. <laughs> okay. All right. And some extra commentary for you. 
So she's referring to the story of Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis. And what she's saying is rather than removing ribs from Adam's side that God had him cut in half and one half was used to make woman. Um, again, uh, this is very concerning teaching to me as I think it should be for all of you as well. Uh, but please pray over these things. Um, I found it very interesting. I, I went, as soon as I disposed of the book, I went right to my room and I got my Bible and I said, God, what, what are you going to show me? What do you have to say with regards to this? And he took me to Isaiah 19. And I had one verse underlined in that portion. It was verse 25. Whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, mine inheritance. Okay, so this was starting to make sense. Egypt, a pagan nation, um, didn't worship God uh, in its natural form, in its natural state. Uh, so I went ahead and I looked a little further up in the chapter to get some more content or context, and God brought me to verse 19, and we're just going to read it through. Uh, in that day shall there be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt. And I feel that this is really the new apostolic reformation. Uh, people that are very religious, but they're not worshiping the true God. Uh, again, in that day shall there be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. At the border thereof to the Lord. And it shall be for a sign and a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. For they shall cry unto the Lord because of the oppressors. And he shall send them a savior and a great one. And he shall deliver them. Verse 21, and the Lord shall be known to Egypt and the Egyptians shall know the Lord in that day and shall do no sacrifice i'm sorry and shall do sacrifice and oblation yea they shall vow a vow unto the lord and perform it and the lord shall smite egypt he shall smite and heal it and they shall return even to the lord and he shall be entreated of them and he shall heal them. 23, in that day shall there be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrian shall come into Egypt, and the Egyptian into Assyria, and the Egyptians shall serve with the Assyrians. They're going to help each other. God will smite Egypt. Why? for their sins, for their blasphemies, for their false prophecies, false teachings. He still loves them. I'll continue. 24, in that day shall Israel be the third with Egypt and with Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the land, whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, mine inheritance. So we know that God loves the number three. We see it repeatedly throughout the Bible. God is putting his precious people, Israel, on the same level, in the same grouping as Egypt, as Syria. Nations who had rebelled against God in awful, wicked ways. And in fact, God brought me also to the book of Jonah and I don't think I pulled that up, but I will because uh, I went ahead and I just took pictures of all of the scripture references that he gave me. So I'll go ahead and, and bring that up in just a little bit. So God loves I 
people all over the earth, none of us is perfect. We all make mistakes. We all uh, ascribe to beliefs that we later realize are false. Um, it's coming to the Bible over and over and over again that will help us discern, not going to other people, not, oh, this is what I wrote down, this is what I wrote down. It is the Word of God. It is the Word of God. And I will demonstrate that uh, in a way that probably sounds a little strange, and that's fine. Uh, I'm, I'm coming very humbly about this. This isn't something that makes me happy. It's, this has hurt my heart to, to come on to this very well. And I know that it's God's heart that I'm sensing. So, for instance, here's a wild prophecy that has been thrown around. I have not embraced myself, but it has been confirmed a number of times. And that, I even roll my eyes just thinking about it. Um, originally, I went to Zephaniah 3. Uh, mistakenly, what I really meant to go to was Zephaniah 1, 17. So the prophecy is that people who, I'm not even going to say it, there will be uh, episodes of zombieism, mass scale of zombieism in uh, the not too distant future. People have been saying this for a while now. And I haven't commented on this channel. I don't ascribe to anything that I cannot verify in scripture. That, that's just a rule. Um, like when people talk about DNA being changed, well, I'm sorry, but DNA was changed at the fall uh, with the angels interbreeding with man. I mean, uh, Stephen Benoon, I know I've referenced, referenced him before. He is probably the best source of end times information right now and study, like biblical studies. And I will have a link to that video. We have fallen DNA. I mean, there were giants. I mean, this didn't just breed out of us. I mean, it's there. It's there. But I keep praying and, and perhaps God will show me and I'll share it with you if that happens. But returning to the topic of zombieism, um, I was listening to my last video, actually, again, just to see how, you know, things were. And I heard something uh, from Zephaniah chapter 1 that caught my ear. Uh, verse 17 says, I will bring distress on mankind so that they will walk like those who are blind because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood will be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. And the more I looked at that and prayed over it, I, I looked and I tried to, to find similar passages, like poured out like dust. I mean, we can look at the altar of God where, you know, blood was poured out during the sacrifice, but it was, it was liquid. It was, it was real blood. This is dust. Is this from a non-living entity? I'm trying to study it and then presenting this to you as well. So you can study it with me. Uh, and then their flesh like dung. Uh, other translations uh, refer to flesh uh, and say intestines, but, but the King James, and I believe the Geneva translation, also an older version, refers to it as the flesh. I mean, your intestines have dung on the inside of them. They're not dung themselves. And even if they were, I mean, that's still not good. Uh, so th this is something that I am praying about. I could see you know, people having visions about flesh falling off of people's skin, looking gross and green and gangrenous and whatever, uh, just based on this scripture. But again, looking for confirmation, uh, let's go ahead and, and take that scripture just a few more back to verse 14. The great day of the Lord is near. Okay, so this gives us some context as well. This is end times. Near and coming very quickly. Listen, the day of the Lord. In it, the warrior cries out bitterly. That day is a day of anger, a day of trouble and distress, a day of destruction and desolation, a day of darkness and gloom, 
a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and the high corner towers. So again, we see darkness. We are anticipating three days of, or however many days of darkness, perhaps three days, just like Jesus said, I believe in Matthew 12, uh, when the Pharisees asked for a sign, he said, no sign will be given to them except for the sign of Jonah who for three days and three nights was in the belly of the whale that that could happen without any other signs and and that would that would be enough uh in chapter or sorry verse 16 of zephaniah 1 we also see a reference to a trumpet uh just after the darkness actually the nest a day of clouds and thick darkness a day of trumpet and battle cry sounds like it's the same day same time period Okay, moving on. Uh, God wasn't done. Uh, but again, I, I do appreciate very much what he said in Isaiah 19, that he's going to chastise everybody. There, there is none righteous, no, not one. Uh, he's going to bring them all together and there will be tribula tribulation, destruction. Um, but the next passage of scripture that God brought me to was actually Haggai chapter one. I didn't have anything underlined. I'll go ahead and just start uh, from verse one. In the second year of Darius the king in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be rebuilt. Okay, his, his true house. We are God's temple. But people are saying, oh, this isn't the end times. Uh, let's talk about proph prophesying over your finances. No, 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 no. Let's talk about getting out of debt. Yes, but being responsible su stewards because we don't want to be caught unawares when the time of God judgment arrives. Verse three, then the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet saying, is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in sealed houses? And this house, the prophet, uh, the the body of Christ, the uh, the true temple of God, not uh, knowing scripture, being anemic, not spending time with God in prayer and his word. This house lie in waste. Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Ye have sown much and brought in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes thus saith the lord of hosts consider your ways go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house and i will take pleasure in it and i will be glorified saith the lord some of us need to have a mountain experience okay and that's not going to be at the beckoning of somebody who calls themselves a prophet or prophetess uh, continuing on, uh, the next God took me to Zechariah 13, 7. These are serious words. Please take these to heart. 7 through 9, a Waco sword against my shepherd and against the man, my associate, declares the Lord of armies. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And I will turn my hand against the little ones. And it will come about in all the land, declares the Lord, that two parts in it will be cut off and perish, but the third will be left in it. And I will bring the third part through the fire, refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say they are my people and they will say the lord is my god okay again god's gonna strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter that is why we have to have our own relationship with him we can't entrust that to anyone else any other teaching he then took me to jeremiah 7 11 which is actually the day that this uh event was held has this house 
which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your sight. Behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. And I instantly thought of all the merchandise that was being sold. It wasn't in the sanctuary, but did it need to be done? Was it funding a holy cause? No, it wasn't. It was funding a cause associated with the new world order, the one world religion. It is coming. Pray on these things. Don't just take my word for it. But these things are coming. And I wonder, you know, the, the speakers, they were asking for donations, said that they needed $64,000. And then I look at, you know, this ministry and I wonder who's funding this woman uh, and, and all of these happenings. And I think that's a very valid question. Uh, it's this ministry, just looking at the teaching is likely under, uh, again, the one world religion that will be headed up by the false prophet, the Pope. And pray over these things, do your research. Uh, next, God took me, I had the same uh, chapter, a couple more scriptures underlined, Jeremiah 7, 18 and 19. The children gather wood. The fathers kindle the fire and the women knead dough to make sacrificial cakes for the queen of heaven. Okay, please take this seriously. And they pour out drink offerings to other gods. They give these prophecies, these messages, these teachings in order to provoke me to anger. Are they provoking me, declares the Lord, is it not themselves instead to their own shame? And I believe another translation even says, uh, references new wine, which is another very common uh, phrase for this group. Well, we don't need new wine. Jesus gave us new wine. Do they have a better teaching than Jesus? I don't think so. I don't think so. I do think that we need to continue to pray over these things. Speak to people in love. Always, always speaking uh, words of affirmation and in love, but also exposing the truth. Exposing the truth and praying that it be exposed. So those were the scriptures that God gave me. We'll go ahead and see where God leads us uh, as well as we close out. Again, this isn't to demonize or pick on anybody, but the, we've got to get real. We've got to get real. People are being deceived. I mean, just listen to these uh, videos that I'm going to attach and, and come to your own conclusions. Pray over them research them. Uh, Lord, please show us great and marvelous things in your word, dear Lord. All right. So Job, I've got parts of 28, 29, and 30, and I'm going to read what I've got underlined. Uh, God understands the way to it, and he alone knows where it dwells. For he views the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. When he establishes the force of of the wind and measured out the waters when he made decree for the rain and for a path I'm sorry and a path for the thunderstorm then he looked at wisdom and appraised it but confirmed it and tested it and he said to man the fear of the Lord that is wisdom and to shun evil is understanding He's not saying, oh, chase after prophecies, try to come up with prophecies. No, fear the Lord. He is going to take care of us in these end times. Uh, ver I'm sorry, that was Job 28, 23 through 28. Uh, here is Job 29, verse 22. After I had spoken, they spoke no more. My words fell gently on their ears. Lord, you're so good to us. You are so patient. You are so merciful. You are so compassionate. And your words fall on our ears very gently, God. We bless your holy name. Draw us close to you, Lord, and thanksgiving. 
and truth and justice and in praise. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.